quite a lot for Neil Channing to get his teeth stuck into. This should be an interesting ride for the next 15 minutes or so. I don't know, it might be about 25 minutes, but let's kick off anyway by uh, paying tribute to the short but very brilliant career, Neil, of David Mullins. Two minutes on whom starts now. Well, yeah, David Mullins retired. Um, it's crazy, really. He's so young. Um, I think he's 24, isn't he? Um, obviously won the Grand National and uh, I think nine grade ones. Um, lots of people sort of say that it's a big problem for racing, particularly in Ireland, that um, you know all the best horses are with just a couple of stables um, and it doesn't give much chances for anyone else. Um, but then you get a jockey who's in one of those stables and he doesn't get much chances. So um, uh, maybe it's a pyramid that's just got too small a top to it um, and that's a bit of a worry um, I did see him sort of saying uh, that people would call him lazy for not wanting to um, drive all around Ireland to back one to, to ride uh, one th a 33 to one shot um, and that he sort of could understand that but and he'd done that before but he just didn't really want to do it anymore I, I guess you know it is a very dangerous sport and if you're not a hundred percent wanting to keep doing it and driven to keep doing it that is probably time to quit um by all accounts though he's a great guy who's smart enough to turn his hand to lots of things uh and i'm sure he'll do well you know his father's a trainer and he's into horse trading or whatever uh, i guess he'll be successful and sometimes if you have that real flair, that real natural talent that manifests early, it's quite difficult to, to keep yourself motivated if you get loads of that grade one success very early on. Yeah, and I, 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 did, I don't know whether he said it, I think his father said it, the, the idea that you're sort of hanging around waiting for your best mate to get injured so that you get lots more rides is a fairly depressing prospect. Um, I think his decision is understandable, really, isn't it? Um, but, uh, you know, fair play to him. He, he, a good jockey. I know you wanted to share your thoughts on the situation that's been unravelling as regards Brani Frost over the last couple of weeks. It's pertinent, again, because she won the feature race at Taunton yesterday on Yala Enki. Um, and you had, one or two, you had one or two observations of what you've seen played out on, on social media. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big social media fan and I, I probably, I know people talk about the racing discourse. I, my timeline probably doesn't have quite as many racing people on it as some people. Um, but I sort of feel like there's been a consensus opinion forming here. And it, it feels to me slightly as if um, the, the kind of Bryony side of the argument is a minority. And um, uh, I mean, obviously we don't, we don't really know exactly what's happened within the weighing room and arguments that have happened or whatever, and there is an inquiry that's ongoing. And to an extent, it, it makes it sort of pointless to talk about the story. But I'm somebody that's never been anywhere near the weighing room uh, and doesn't, doesn't work in racing media. So I, I feel like, just as an outside observer, um, the idea that pretty much everyone has turned around and said, you know, stuff happens in races and then we go and shake each other's hands and we all get on um, and, nothing to see here is kind of a form of bullying really because if, if there has been bullying taking place and literally you know 99 percent of the people who are involved in the sport say there's nothing to see here well then they're just kind of denying it aren't they and uh, i also think the the whole gender thing you know there are two different changing rooms if 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 two blokes get involved in a bit of a contretemps halfway around the course it is possible that they can just walk back into the weighing room. Um, you know, they're, they're having a shower, they're standing next to each other, getting changed. They, you know, they can chat it over and, and it can be sorted very quickly. But if one of the participants goes into the other changing room and they don't really, um, you know, kind of live on top of each other in the same way, uh, it's much harder for them to move on from it and things can brew and, and stew. And I kind of feel like that might be what's happened here. But I, I do sort of feel like quite a lot of sort of, a lot of females who have ridden in the past or are currently riding came out um, after the Adam Wedge uh, comments after the Welsh Grand National and sort of said, oh, this is all nonsense. 
And it probably is nonsense. I'm sure Adam Wedge just said a, an expression that people use all the time, and I'm not having a go at Adam Wedge at all. But I notice people seem very quick to... There's not many people that seem to be sympathetic towards Bryony and all this. And I, I think in her interviews that I've watched in uh, yesterday, particularly after she had a winner on Yola Enki, uh, and just generally, she's maybe forcing herself to be less ebullient. And one of the things I really like about Bryony is that she is so ebullient. And uh, I think it's a shame if she's having to temper her natural demeanor to fit in with racing that is a form of bullying. Let's talk now about Royal Ascot, which this week announced its decision to go to seven races a day, Neil, um, adding some of those existing handicaps that were first put on the cards because of COVID in 2020. How do you feel about that? Well, initially when I saw it, I, didn't, I, I did the thing which you should never do of reading the headline or not reading the story. And I made a little schneidy comment on Ascot's Twitter feed saying, are you having a mayor's hurdle? Um, I, I think it's totally different from the whole kind of, uh, you know, fifth day at Cheltenham uh, stuff, because what they're not doing is, you know, I, I am a bit critical of Cheltenham in that um, they have got a situation now where we've got, you know, two mile, two and a half miles and three miles at different distances and horses can avoid each other. That's not what's happening at Ascot. They're just bringing in a load of really good handicaps. And seeing as I like betting on really good handicaps, and actually, you know, you can look at the stats of, of betting turnover. The public love betting on really good handicaps, particularly at, at Royal Ascot. Um, that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? It's extra turnover. It's extra money to the sport. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a whole year of having 10 race cards um, at, at all kinds of places around the country. It does seem a bit weird in a way that we only have six races at Royal Ascot normally. I, I think it worked really well last year. I was quite a fan, actually, of the, the silver uh, um, Wokingham and the silver Hunt Cup. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, maybe they could look at, if they don't want to bring that into the Royal Meeting, maybe they could think about um, what they do with Kempton after Cheltenham, where they have the kind of reserve races and have a meeting a week later. Uh, but, the, you know, those handicaps at Royal Ascot, they always fill. You don't get many horses out of the handicap. Um, so you should probably have more handicaps there. I, I, I can't, what's not to like? It's a good thing. Um, I, I did see Kevin Blake made an interesting point. We won't go on to Cheltenham five days, <laughs> but he, he did make a quite an interesting point, I thought, which I hadn't seen anyone else make. Uh, which is, if, if you did make it five days, maybe just have um, five races a day and have 50 minutes between them. So you can have more time to punt, more time for people to reflect on the result and talk and interview the participants afterwards. Um, you know, having making the festivals longer doesn't necessarily mean you have to have more races. Um, but actually, on this one, I think it's fine. I think Ascot have done a, a good thing. Excellent. OK, let's move on to, to crowds. And there's been sort of a lot of preoccupation this week as to when we, we might see them back. But it had been a subject that rightly, really, during this latest variant wave of the pandemic, we'd, we'd parked. I, I, I just don't know how you can see beyond the end of tomorrow, really. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it's slightly distasteful. I appreciate that racing is an industry and... Uh, just by not having crowds on course, some small race courses uh, are put in a precarious position where they literally may not be in business at the end of all this. Um, and, you know, that would be very sad. I don't want to see any race courses go out of business. On the other hand, uh, you know, we, we're having upwards of 1,500 people dying every day. Uh, the intensive care wards in this country are all full up, uh, literally waiting for people to die so that new people can go in. Uh, in the in a world where horse racing got quite a lot of criticism, probably wrongly, over the situation with running Cheltenham uh, last year, I think it's a bad look for the sport to be sort of clamouring uh, to get crowds in. I think uh, it'll happen when it happens. Um, I'm sure the BHA are talking to government as much as possible. I totally get the fact that it's an outdoor sport and there are huge amounts of uh, stuff within the regulations that don't make any sense. 
Uh, it's perfectly fine for people to work in the DVLC centre that's riddled uh, with uh, COVID when they could easily work from home, but it's not all right for people to stand in the wide open spaces of Cheltenham. Um, but then, you know, how many people do you let in? If you only let in a few thousand and they all have to spread out, the course probably loses money anyway. Uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I think, y yeah, you have to play it by ear. I, somebody was tweeting yesterday that Royal Ascot was going to be cancelled, which I, I can't see. I can't see them making a decision. E even if it was, why would they make a decision right. now? Uh, it, it, no, no, you know, if I was running any of those courses, of course, you wait until the last minute because the story is ever evolving. Let's talk about the mix-up with the two horses in the Phillies Mile that cost Aidan O'Brien £4,000 this week. This, of course, was a part consequence of COVID because of a satellite team of, of staff that he had over at Newmarket. He's held his hands up, accepted responsibility. He's offered a profuse apology. But, Neil, isn't it the case that the systems have got to be in place to stop this happening, even if the trainer and his staff make an error? Because at the end of the day, it's the sport and its integrity that loses out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's difficult because I, I, I'm not saying that without COVID this wouldn't have happened uh, because it could have still happened without COVID. I mean, he he quite rightly says, well, you know, we, we had a situation where staff that weren't totally familiar with those fillies travelled over and they weren't, they didn't immediately recognise them. Um, but then the sports regulator had no way of checking them. Uh, and some people might say, well, as they leave the race course stable, uh, you know, they can be scanned or whatever. Um, I, I, you know, the more levels of, of regulation that you bring in, there is a cost to this stuff. You know, if you have to have somebody there checking all the horses as they leave the stable and whatever, that's potentially an extra member of staff at every race course on every race day. Uh, you might say, well, that's a small price to pay for making sure that we have integrity in the sport and that the right horses are competing under their right names in the right races. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a strong feeling on it. I feel like, um, yeah, I'm sure no, there was, you know, obviously there was nothing dodgy going on here. It was just a mistake. Uh, Aidan's put his hands up. He's paid the fine. I, I sort of... I'm sure racing's thinking, I, I, I hope the BHA are thinking about it, I'm sure they are. Um, there's probably stuff that can be done about it, it probably has a small cost attached to it, it probably needs to be done. Now many racecourses around the country, Neil, are you, being used at the moment as vaccination hubs. I mean they are the perfect vaccination hubs in, in, in many respects. Uh, there was a bit of pushback this week because it was erroneously reported that Newbury were suspending vaccination in order to hold horse racing, which garnered lots of negative publicity. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that the, the GP surgery responsible for this said it's not holding the vaccination process up at all because we don't vaccinate seven days a week, people were still keen to pile on. And it's not just Newbury, it was the case with Taunton yesterday, that made the South West news. And people have got to get their facts right before, before they start piling into these racecourses who are providing a very valuable service. At least that's what I think. Do you agree with me? I definitely agree with you. I mean, obviously, it's a good thing uh, for the race courses that they're making themselves available as vaccination centres. They are businesses. They have lost a lot of money during COVID uh, and the NHS is prepared to pay them uh, to, to be host to vaccinate as a host for vaccination centres. Uh, and they are a good place. They're, you know, they're wide open spaces. They have big car parks, whatever. Um, I guess it all comes down to sort of uh, the look again, doesn't it? And the PR, possibly they needed to be a bit more on the front foot. Um, maybe if they'd have put stories into the media to say we're volunteering to do this and, uh, you know, it's helping to save our business and our staff and, uh, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship, everything's good about this, it's, it's giving our staff and our business uh, literally a shot in the arm um, and uh, not really literally, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, maybe, maybe they could have got a bit more on the front foot. It, it feels like people want to knock horse racing. Again, you know, we had that thing with Cheltenham last year uh, where, you know, racing got a lot of criticism, some of it not, not really very fair. Um, and I, I feel like here, yeah, racing is getting a bit, 
it's kick the cat sort of, isn't it? And it's it's not it's not fair and it's not right. You know, clearly, I, I, I think I saw with the Newbury one, they said they'd already done all their doses that they had anyway. So exactly. even if they hadn't have been racing midweek, exactly. uh, they, they wouldn't have been able to do any more vaccinations. Um, yeah, I, they probably just needed to be a bit more on the front foot PR wise. Well, Hopefully I mean, the, the story's dead now. Um, the statement, I mean, I, was, all, the statement sure was all out the, there. and, the, and the, Yeah, anyway, right, we'll move on to yeah, the Yeah, Doncaster, Newbury, Taunton and other places are going to do more vaccinations, aren't they? So uh, I guess there's more opportunities for people that want to not racing to not racing. Hopefully it's not much of a story. It, it was all going so well. The delay got the delay got me in the end. Uh, do you know what? Neil Channing lives so close to here, I could pretty much do that and we'd, we'd probably have a better connection or two, two, <laughs> two cups with a piece of string. Right, I, I do want you to conclude on the Gambling Act review, something that's making plenty of people um, hot under the collar and quite rightly for all sorts of different reasons. I'd like to think we've a, approached this in a, in a balanced way over the last few weeks, um, Neil, or at least before, before we took the break. Um, how far have we progressed and what do people need to know about this now? Um, OK, so, yeah, we, the Gambling Act review, uh, so there will be reform of the Gambling Act later in the year. We don't need to worry about that too much at the moment. The thing that we need to worry about is the consultation uh, with the Gambling Commission about um, affordability checks uh, and, and gambling generally. Uh, so the Gambling Commission have asked people to make submissions to them uh, so that they can present that to uh, DCMS and government uh, and they can look at uh, any changes in regulation that they need. And primarily the government are quite interested in introducing affordability checks um, and the think tank that they're largely listening to have suggested uh, that if people deposit more than £100 uh, in a month with a gambling company, then they should have to have gone through some quite stringent checking, which involves sending in your P60, uh, you know, looking at your incoming and outgoing every month. Uh, I heard a case recently from anecdotally from somebody working in one of the big companies. He told me he had a customer who earns 143,000 a year. He can prove that and he's been told he's allowed to deposit 550 pounds a week. His average bet over the last 10 years has been 800 pounds. Uh, he told him, right, you're allowed to deposit 550. He had 400 quid on a loser and then rung up to complain that he couldn't have much of a bet in the next race. Um, you know, if you think that uh, this is something that doesn't really affect you and you're not really interested in it, you, you might find in a few months time uh, that unless you're prepared to go through quite stringent checks, uh, you're not going to be allowed to deposit more than £25 a week. And, it, you know, for a lot of punters, that, that's going to that's going to affect a lot of punters. Uh, the, the, the firms are saying on horse racing, that's about 50 percent of punters affected uh, and their turnover you know, will drop and that will mean a, a lack of prize money um, and funding for racing. The, uh, the review was due to close in January, but apparently so many people have submitted uh, that they've decided to uh, make the period that they're taking submissions a bit longer. I think it goes on now to the 12th of February. Uh, and they've also made the form a bit simpler. It used to take about 25 minutes to fill out and it was quite cumbersome. Uh, now it's a, a much shorter questionnaire. So hopefully if you were put off at all by doing it in the past or you thought you'd missed the chance, uh, you should get involved now. Neil, thank you very much. And you can get involved by uh, going to www.consult.gamblingcommission.gov.uk and have your voice heard. And they want as many voices as possible. And that has been extended. Neil, thank you very much. We will he hear from Neil again on this programme, I'm sure, uh, very shortly. But after this break, uh, I will be talking to Ryan Mania, who has made a really important comeback to the saddle.